Good morning, students. Am I audible? Am I audible, students? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good morning. Okay, so uh, today we'll just go through the in introduction of our course, okay, construction engineering management. Uh, from next class onwards, I'll start with my lectures. And today, whatever, not only for today, whatever videos we go through, that things you have to keep that in mind because uh, questions and everything related to exam will be given based on my notes and also the videos. And also you tell your friends to join by 10.30. After that, I log the meeting and then I won't allow any admission, okay? Is that clear? Okay.
Man, the video is not playing. Yeah, I'll play the video at 10.30. I'll lock the meeting first and then I'll play it. So tell your friends to join. After lock after locking the meeting, no admission will be given, okay? I'll start it now. Okay. Namaskar and welcome to this series of lectures in the massive open online course initiative titled Principles of Construction Management. Yes, ma'am. Now, this is the first lecture in this module and we will talk about the general overview in the course. What is the backdrop with which we are talking about construction management? We are looking at infrastructure management or infrastructure creation as an integral part of development, especially in developing countries. Whether it is the design and construction of roads, airports, houses, industry, or whatever. This kind of infrastructure is absolutely required to achieve any kind of development. Now, large-scale construction activities are involved in many of these projects, which could include roads and railways, like I said, in the transport infrastructure, power plants in the energy sector, or industrial construction, for example, refineries. In this course, we are concerned primarily with the construction phase of these projects, as we will see in this lecture and as well as as we go along in the other lectures of the course. There are different stages or phases that we have in any of these large projects, beginning with conceiving the project, doing a planning and then the detailed planning, construction, finally operation and so on. So in this course, as I've said here, we are primarily concerned with the issues that are of importance during the construction of these projects. Now, we must remember that every construction project 
is unique in terms of local conditions, the people involved in the construction process, the design of the facility, whatever it is, the equipment involved in the construction, and the quality of materials. For example, even if we are talking of metro construction in different cities, in different countries, even though the technology is the same, but the project in city one and the city two is unique because of the people involved in constructing it, the equipment that they use to implement the same technology, the quality or the characteristics of the materials that are being used and so on. Also, every construction project involves a commitment of a huge amount of resources in terms of funds, manpower, material, equipment and time. Any of these infrastructure projects can easily span over several months and sometimes several years. Now what happens as a result of this is that at different stages, right from the word go, somebody has to plan what kind of resources, what kind of equipment, for example, will be needed at different points in time as the project progresses. What kind of manpower will be required at different points in time of the project as it moves through completion. Similarly, very important is the issue of what is called cash flow. Now, cash flow essentially refers to the flow of funds. There will be a total cost associated with any project, but that amount of money or that fund is not required immediately as we start the project. As different activities get completed, different amounts of money or different amount of fund is required. So this requires a planning, a foresight into how the project will move. And this kind of a thought process is an absolutely integral part of a construction management plan. Now, let us look at who the stakeholders in a large construction project are. Please remember that as I have said, we are not talking of, in this course, a small project. Even though bits and pieces of whatever we talk about will be applicable to even the smallest of projects, but it's perhaps easier if we are able to visualize a large construction project and keep that in mind when we talk of some of these things. So coming to the stakeholders in the construction project, there are at least these six entities which are involved. Now let's look at the client. Now the client is essentially the owner of the facility. If it's a road project, in India, for example, it could be the NHAI or the state government. They become the clients. Now, the person who owns this facility does not necessarily have to have the expertise to design the project or design roadways or the bridges that will come in a road project and so on. And therefore, the client has to have a designer who will actually carry out the design. Now, this design could be functional, it could be aesthetic, it could be structural. So, depending on what kind of design we are looking at, we will need to have the services of a company or a set of people who can be clubbed as designers. Then, there is a contractor. Now, the contractor is the agency which actually carries out the work. They do the execution of the project. They construct the project. Of late, investors have also become a very important player in this whole game. We often hear of the PPP model, that is the Public-Private Partnership model, where the funds for these projects are not being provided by the government. Traditionally, the client used to provide the funds, especially for large infrastructure projects. It was the government which was the owner of projects, but of late, it has been realized that we can and we perhaps should have the involvement of investors in the project. So then we come in with 
investors, that could be banking institutions, it could be the contractor who takes a loan and so on and so forth. All kinds of models are being talked about. So different models are being implemented in India, in other countries in the world and so on. Then there is the regulator. Now government now and government agencies largely play the role of a regulator. That is, they are the people who are charged with the responsibility of ensuring that the design, the construction and the operation is done as per an existing or an agreed guideline or a specification. So there are regulatory agencies like the standardization agencies, the people who write test methods and so on. So there will be a regulatory agency which will lay down the methods for testing concrete, for example. What kind of concrete is acceptable or not? These are the rules of the game that have to be decided before the project actually starts. Sometimes, of course, there is a need to change those specifications as we go along, as we become wiser with the execution of the project. But there is this regulatory agency and the documents that are issued from time to time by the regulatory agencies. Then at the end of it, and in fact it should have been perhaps in the beginning of it, there is the user. Now the user is often not necessarily involved in all phases of the project. For example, if it's a road project, the user is the guy who's actually driving the car or the person who's driving the truck. But those people are not directly involved in the planning of the project, the construction of the project and so on, but they are very much part of the, in fact, the whole project is being built for them. Their needs and requirements should therefore, should always be kept at the back of our mind when we actually do the design. And that is what is normally ensured in the design process. And that's why we have design guidelines. So those are the kind of technical details which we are already familiar with. So we, in this course, are looking at the entire issue of a project, its design, its construction, and so on, from a management perspective. And we are trying to figure out what are the roles and responsibilities, the importance of the different stakeholders. Because at the end of it, these different stakeholders will play a very important role as far as management of the project is concerned. Apart from these, there are other stakeholders for example, there could be safety auditors, which in one sense of the word can be a part of the regulatory agency. There could be safety auditors, which again is not necessarily a part of the regulatory mechanism, but they could be outside agencies which are involved in the safety and quality audits of projects. Similarly, there could be third party consultants. A consultant and a designer sometimes may be the same sometimes may be different. The designers are basically general purpose design companies or firms, whereas consultants are more specialized in their jobs. So even designers or contractors, or for that matter, even the client may sometimes hire a consultant or request a consultant to help in a certain process, whether it's the design or the construction or whatever it may be. And of course, this list is not exhaustive and there are other people who could be also stakeholders in a project. So now, coming to the stages in a project, we have the concept. That is, somebody thinks or puts together a proposal that we need a road to connect point A and point B. This concept is now put into a planning stage where the routing, for example, for that road is decided. Because to connect point A and point B, there could be multiple routes which will have individual difficulties. So, for example, if we go by route 1, there could be a river to be crossed at one place. In route 2, the river could, may need to be crossed at another point which will have its own local geographical conditions and so on. So, this is the stage where this kind of routes are examined and we come up with different options. Followed by planning, we go into design, where 
more specific details or more information is gathered and based on that information, the actual design exercise starts. Once the design is completed, we go into the execution phase where the project is taken out of the drawing board and is implemented at site. Now we must remember that as far as construction projects are concerned and that is the project that is our target in this course, they have to be implemented in the field. And the project which does not get implemented on the field, there are projects which do not see the light of the day and are not implemented. But that is not what is of our concern right now. So once the project goes to the field, then the construction activities start. After the project has been completed, the project is put into operation. Once the road is completed, it's open to traffic. Most of the time we think that the cycle ends there. But sooner or later we'll have to be concerned with this stage called decommissioning, where we say that, okay, this road or this bridge has served its purpose and now needs to be replaced. Now, once we are replacing a bridge, we have to be careful, we have to plan as to what we will do with that bridge which has been built and has served its purpose. We must remember that this total cost, including the design, execution, operation and decommissioning is what constitutes the life cycle cost of the project. So now, the concept of life cycle costing of a project is coming into our thinking in a big way. And we are bothered about the cost of a project, not only up to the execution stage, but also to include how much is the cost while the project is being operated. And finally, what it will cost to decommission that particular project or that particular road or a bridge or whatever it is. It goes without saying that more meticulous the plan, smoother is the execution. It depends on us if we are able to foresee the kind of difficulties that will arise as the project goes through different stages, the execution in the project will be smooth. If we have not foreseen difficulties that may arise, then it will be a stop and go situation. And that is extremely detrimental to any project from the point of view of time overruns, cost overruns, and so on and so forth. A smooth execution, what does that mean? It means management of time, cost, quality, unplanned changes on the field, and disputes. So if we are able to do a meticulous plan, we'll be able to ensure that we are able to complete the project in time, we are able to implement the project with good quality at the cost that it was expected to be completed without having too many unplanned changes on account of field conditions and without any disputes. So now coming to this course, this discussion of ours for about 40 lectures or 40 sessions has been divided into different modules. The first module is a general overview and introduction to the course and that's what we are starting to do today. The next one is estimation of a project cost, followed by some amount of construction economics, planning and scheduling in projects. That is actually divided into two parts. We have quality management, safety management, and finally, legal aspects of a construction project. So this course, as you can see, is not really a depth course. That is, we will probably not have the time, it's not intended that we go very deep into any of these aspects, but it's a width course where the effort will be to expose you different aspects of management of a construction project so that you are better prepared to handle a construction project from a management point of view and also you appreciate the kind of information or the kind of skills that a project manager should have. In most colleges in our education system, we have 
courses related to project management or construction management as part of uh, the civil engineering curriculum. But most of the time, they concentrate on the planning and scheduling part. So we'll, of course, do some planning and scheduling, but we'll try to cover some other aspects as well. So now, coming to the first module on the general overview and project organization, we'll basically talk about stakeholders, phases and features of a construction project, a typical organizational structure, the role of a project manager, and very importantly, the multidisciplinary nature of construction projects. We'll talk about the resources that are required in a construction project and introduce the concept of the S-curve. Now, the S-curve is a very interesting idea which helps us understand the extent of progress of a project. We must remember that if we think of a road project, there are different activities involved. Any project will have completely different activities involved. There could be land acquisition, there could be excavation, there could be some amount of design going on, and so on. So now at a given point in time, how do we say what percentage of the project is complete? Is the project 10% complete or is it 20% complete? So how do we answer this question? The S-curve provides one of the options. So in fact, I must share with you that this course is not really a very objective discussion. There is a certain amount of subjectivity. There is a certain amount of openness that, okay, there is no unique solution. It's only a matter of a thought process. It's more of information that you have and how you interpret it is left more or less to the practice, the person who's actually taking decisions. So as far as the second module is concerned, which will deal with estimation of project costs, we must remember that the cost of a project has at least two sides to it. One is the cost that the client is willing to pay for a certain project. If the client thinks of a project as an owner that, okay, I want to build a road from point one to point two, what is the estimated cost of that project? So we will look at cost estimates, the client's estimate, preliminary estimates, detailed estimates, item description, construction equipment, depreciation, overheads, introduction to contracts and bidding processes, contractors' estimates, and concepts of markup. So at the outset, the client makes an estimate that, okay, for this project, this will be the total cost. The client goes to the market, invites tenders, and different people express their willingness. Different people means different contractors. They express their willingness. They submit their bids to complete that project in a certain amount of money. This amount obviously need not completely match the estimate from the client side. Of course, if the client has done a thorough job, the differences are likely to be small. If that job is not very thorough, the differences are likely to be large. And those are the kind of things which we will talk about as we go along in this course. We'll talk about construction economics in module three. Now, what we'll talk about here is concepts like cash flow, the time value of money, payback period, return on investment, evaluating alternatives based on cash flows, concepts of NPV, IRR, discounted payback period, evaluating projects of unequal lives, uh, capital rationing, taxation, inflation, and cost-benefit ratio. So you can imagine that there is a whole lot of things to be done. And in fact, as we go along, you will realize that sometimes I will just make a definition and then leave it for you to do some homework and understand on your own using literature and the kind of textbooks or papers which are available. Modules four and five will deal primarily with planning and scheduling of activities. Here in module four, we'll talk about introduction to construction planning, project plans, work breakdown structure, network diagrams, precedence rules, AOA, AON, bar charts, 
CPM PERT and so on. At the bottom of it, the thought process is that different activities in a project cannot be all started at the same time. Certain activities have to be completed before certain other activities can be taken up. So we cannot do, for example, the superstructure of a bridge unless we have done the foundations. So in that sense, the foundations precede the superstructure. Civil engineers are often the last to complete their design because a lot of input for civil design comes from mechanical and electrical engineers. But the civil engineers are the first to be at site to start the project, to start the construction in the project. For example, if there's an industry or an industrial construction and you want to put a cooling tower, so the construction of the cooling tower is indeed a civil engineer's job, but the capacity of the cooling tower, the technology to be used and so on, is definitely not a civil engineer's cup of tea. So somebody else will decide those things and finally give that input to the civil engineer who has to start his design. Even to take another example, even in building construction, suppose you have a multi-story building where you want to install a lift. So somebody has to first tell you the specifications which are required for the lift and only then you can design your lift well. And unless you design your lift well, you cannot actually complete the design of the building. So that's what I mean to say when I say that the civil engineers get the input the last, but they are the first to actually start the work. You cannot have the lift installed unless the building has been completed. So anyway, that's what we'll talk about when we talk about planning and scheduling. In the second part, we'll look at this planning and scheduling discussion from a slightly different perspective and talk about resource allocation, resource leveling, network crashing, the cost of crashing, and the cost time trade-off. Now, module six would deal with some principles of quality management, where we'll talk about quality control, quality assurance, total quality management, quality audits, the cost of quality, ISO standards, and inspection.